Nova Scotia is a beautiful land of vast forests, fields, and endless stretches of rocky shore. In the 1930s, the people of this land traced their ancestry from native, French, British, German, and African sources. Most men were involved in the logging, fishing, or farming industries, or were among the many unemployed. When the Second World War broke out on September 1, 1939, the West Nova Scotia Regiment was immediately mobilized by Lieutenant Colonel G.W. Bullock. Oren Foster was one of the first recruits to train under the Colonel. He was a real gentleman. He was a pastor too, as well as commanding officer, and uh, never heard a wrong word said about him. In a few days, 1,600 young men from all over the small province rushed to join the battalion with a normal strength of 850. I enlisted in September the 5th, 1939. Big pay of a dollar a day was a lot of money to a boy in 1938 or 39. The average age of the recruit was in his late teens. Some lied about their age and got in even younger. I was only 17 when I joined. The officer said to me, how old are you? I said, I'm 16. I'm sorry, he said, you're too young. So I'm home, came back the next week. He said, how old are you? I said, I'm 20. Okay, good enough, he said, go on. Well, I joined when I was 18, and we went to Bridgewater. From Bridgewater, we were in the uh, exhibition building. We were sleeping on the floor in that building. Canada was unprepared for war. The army was short on all military supplies, and the new recruits waited two months for uniforms. They trained for three weeks at the Aldershot camp in Nova Scotia. We left by train and went to Halifax. You've got to realize at that time I was about 19 years of age. Hadn't been anywhere very much. The biggest boat I'd ever been on was a rowboat. And here we were on a big liner. The battalion left Halifax on December 22nd on the Polish ship Chaubry. The regimental band played O Canada. The regiment would not see the shores of Nova Scotia again for five years and nine months. Many of the boys would never see their homes again. They had a rough passage across the Atlantic. The North Atlantic is not a pleasant place in the winter time. We, we left Halifax in a blizzard and I was seasick while we were still in the harbor. <laughs> Ten days on the North Atlantic. Once we left port, they took to their bunk and never got out of it until we got to Scotland. They spent their first Christmas away at sea. The regiment landed in Scotland shortly after Christmas. They immediately traveled to Aldershot, England. The boys of the West Novas trained hard for the next three years and six months for their coming battles. On March 2, 1942, the West Novas were visited by their future commander, General Montgomery. One of the things he was concerned with was physical fitness. And he started um, um, five mile runs in full battle order. We were fallen in and told from then until the course ended in 30 days time, we wouldn't walk again, we'd be running. On January 24th, the regiment was inspected by King George VI. We moved from place to place on the south coast. I guess that was in case uh, the invasion did come. We were on many, many schemes, and uh, we were playing at war, really. The West Nova Scotia's famous first dev unit from the Blue Nose province. During the Blitz from November to December 1940, 60 German bombs fell in the regimental area. There was a belt of anti-aircraft guns just beyond where we were billeted. And they'd open up on the German bombers as they came over, and some of the German bombers would drop their bombs and hightail it back to, to the continent. 
On January 6, 1942, six men were drowned while making a crossing on the River Adyar. It was overloaded. There were six men in it, and there should have only been three. And they left one bank to cross to the other bank. And uh, the commanding officer, he wanted to make it a bit realistic, so he threw a thunder flash and exploded right beside the boat. And everybody stood up, and everybody went in the river. I got three, uh, three of them out, and one... Uh, he, he was underwater and he had blonde hair, and I just reached and I just missed his hair. Oren Foster was the first Canadian soldier to be awarded a medal by the King in the Second World War. July 22nd, Lieutenant Colonel Bogart took command of the regiment. He's the man who will ultimately lead them into battle. Colonel Bogart was a very good commanding officer, good sense of humor and a sensible man. On June 15, 1943, the regiment finally boarded ships in England to join Operation Husky. The hour was at hand. In the last days of June 1943, thousands of Canadian troops, men of the 1st Canadian Division, set sail in two enormous convoys to a destination as yet unknown. Three years of battle-minded training, months of careful planning, intense organization. Men, machines and material were going into history. Oh, on the way out, incidentally, in the Mediterranean, we lost three ships in the convoy, including the second one, which had loaded in Manchester with us and had a third of our people and equipment and the vehicles on board. It was sunk. I was looking at it through my field glasses when the torpedo hit her. There's 3,000 ships there. Most of them were battleships and destroyers, and they cut loose about 4 o'clock in the morning. I stood there and looked towards the coast, and a solid wall of fire, bursting shells. And I thought to myself, it's an unhealthy place to be, and we'll be there shortly. The next morning, on July 10th, 1943, the West Nova Scotia Regiment landed on the beaches of Sicily, near Pacino, in a reserve role. They met no opposition and started their push inland at midnight. After marching all night, C Company was fired upon by a group of Italian soldiers. Lieutenant Ray McCarthy charged forward with a jammed rifle and a small group of soldiers and captured four heavy machine guns and 26 prisoners. Once they see his company, they fired a burst of shot, you know, and that was it. Their only rest came on July 14th when General Montgomery visited the battalion their Italian opponents surrendered in droves. They had got to the point where they, they wanted to get out of the war, and they surrendered by the thousands. The untried troops of the West Nova Scotia Regiment soon encountered the Germans in the island's mountainous interior. They were good, tough fighters. And we admired them because they were, there was no BS about them, they, and they weren't dirty. You, you get them first because they're going to get you after. There's no choice there. You're too busy to be spared. Well, the training that you've had automatically takes over. Every day, I had the same feeling. I, I see the sun going down tonight, but will I see it come up in the morning? Every day. Every day that you were in battle, you were, you were scared. I know I was. The regiment chased the retreating Germans through Espica, Vecina, and Piazza Amarina. Machine gun fire and that sort of thing would be directed at you, but you wouldn't physically see too many Germans, or sometimes you wouldn't see any. As we advanced to the north, about every town was defended by the Germans. We had to do one thing that I never liked. Sometimes they asked us to ride on tanks. A, a tank is not an easy thing to ride on over rough country. And uh, nobody wants to be on the front of a tank because if you ever got thrown off, you, your days have ended. So everybody wanted to be kind of on the back and nothing much to, to hold on to, only rivets. And we, I guess we left our fingernails in the rivets. The days were spent marching through deep dust and horrible heat. The nights were cold and plagued by mosquitoes. 
It was hot and dusty. It was hot as hell and twice as dusty. <laughs> the regiment climbed Mount Della Forma under fire, only to find that the Germans had withdrawn as they reached the peak. The retreating Germans continued to fire machine guns, mortars, and tanks at the bare mountaintop. Here, the West Novas were jarred by the first combat death from amongst their ranks. I saw my first casualty there, and uh, it wasn't easy, but uh, I thought to myself, well, I got to get used to this because there's a lot of this coming up. On July 21st, the regiment took the little village of Libertina without opposition. Soon after, the Germans started to shell the village. The barrage was to last five days. Men died and were wounded with no chance to hit back. Private John King was later to be awarded the Military Medal for attending the wounded while shells exploded around him. Uh, we had got inland a little ways. I think the, the town of Rigobuta was the first one that we had trouble taking. If you showed any movement during the day, you get shelled and mortar. It's kind of unpleasant. The West Novas were moved to just outside Catnanuova. At 11.30 in the evening, an artillery barrage crept towards the town. The West Novas followed so closely that Captain Stan Smith and seven other men were hit by their own shells. And I was the signal corporal for Captain Smith. And one of our shells landed behind the side of us. I think they deliberately pulled out and let us take the town because they encircled us afterwards. The next night, the Germans counterattacked. They hit the northeast corner of the town with tanks and infantry. It was held by A Company under Lieutenant Ross Guy. The Germans overran the position in confused firefights. Lieutenant Guy rallied his company and called in artillery that smashed the attacks. The Germans were deflected towards C Company under Captain McNeil. He led a bayonet charge and killed or captured the German survivors. For this action, both officers were awarded the Military Cross. We killed quite a few Germans there, but we had quite a few casualties. Three times the shell hit right in front of my slit trench and cut me pretty over. The Germans pulled out of Cat Man, you over. On August 2nd, 1943, the West Novas moved forward to occupy Mount Criscannon. It was held by two companies of elite German paratroops. It would become known as Whistling Hill for the amount of shell fire the Germans brought down on them. The, the regiment was trying, trying to dig in and we came under awful heavy artillery fire. And I thought, I don't think I'll be coming back. I drove for the, my slip trench, but I didn't have a dug deep enough. I got my head down and I kind of left my rear up in the air and caught it. A Company under Captain John Smeltzer and D Company under Captain Al Rogers moved into the attack. The Germans waited until they were in open ground before firing their masked machine guns. Lieutenant Reeves was killed. Private Thomas Martel seized a brand gun and charged forward to save the other members of his section. Stretcher bearer Gordon Spinney would be awarded the Military Medal for his tireless efforts in assisting the wounded during the fight. The attack failed under the hail of bullets. The Germans fell back and the fighting stopped as they evacuated to Italy. It took 38 days to capture the island of Sicily. Released from the pressure of fighting, time was spent in rest and refitting the battalion. On September 1st, the West Nova Scotia Regiment moved to Catania. They embarked for the invasion of Italy on September 3rd at 2.30 in the morning. A massive barrage preceded the attack. The West Novas landed on the mainland of Italy at the heavily fortified port of Reggio. I went in with B Company, but we were landed two to three miles to the west of our objective. There was little resistance from the Italian troops holding the port. Our two forward companies 
had gone up the mountain and they'd taken over these two forts who were manned by Italians who had no wish to fight at all. The West Novas were the first Allied unit to land in mainland Europe since the British left Dunkirk. They were to stay on the continent of Europe for the entire duration of the war. And it was, it was a maze of rivers there running down from the Apennines. It was rivers not very wide, but they were deep and fast flowing and cold. And we had to wait sometimes at these rivers for, for a uh, Bailey Bridge to be built. And they usually had laid mines there. So we were tiptoeing through the mines as if that would help. The West Novas moved north. We marched all one night, uphill all the way, in full marching order, carrying everything. On September 8th, the regiment was surprised by Italian paratroops. It was these fellows coming out of the woods with uh, machine guns, and they started firing at it. And I, at us, and I was one of the first ones hit. As I lay on the ground, they were throwing grenades at us, and they were going off all around. And I thought, what a hell of a place to be hit. There's no way they could bring anybody in to take us out because the breeders were all blown. Company Sergeant Major Reg Foley was hit, as well as the medical officer, Captain Hardy. On September 11th, the West Nova Scotia Regiment moved to Catanzara and then to Francovilla by landing craft. The roads and bridges to the north had all been blown up or mined by the retreating Germans. On September 17th, the West Novas became the core of a new combined arms battle group, Beaufort. This group was led by their old commander, Colonel Bogert. In 60 hours, they moved 75 miles from Villa Piana to Potenza. The men often had to clear rubble from the road to get through. The Germans had hoped to hold the town with a company of the West Nova's old enemies, the paratroops. But the rapid advance and the greater numbers overwhelmed them, and Beaufort captured the town by the 20th. The casualties in Italy had been light so far. Twelve men had been killed and 33 wounded. The heavy casualties lay ahead. On the 28th, the regiment moves to Palazzo. Two days later, they continue on through Canosa and Serignola in a thunderstorm. On October 7th at 7 a.m., Canadian artillery opened fire on Gambatesa. Lieutenant McNeil and Lieutenant Rice led 200 men into a storm of fire. They crossed the Fotori River under a hail of mortars, machine guns, and 20 millimeter cannon fire. But the Nova Scotians beat everything their elite enemy could throw at them. At 1 a.m. on November 23, 1943, B Company, under Captain Burns, infiltrates Castel de Sangro. They were not supposed to fire a shot till they got inside. And we had some American some recruits, you know, never been in action before, and they fired a shot. And the Germans just got behind their machine guns. And it was just like a beehive. Five or six machine guns fired 1,500 rounds a minute, you can imagine. And Major Burns said, I'm not staying here. So when he said that, I took the water and said off my back, I said, I'm going with you. The second platoon was virtually wiped out. The regiment attacked in force the next day and drove the Germans from the hill. The West Novas crossed the Sangro River under shell fire, but were blessedly without casualties. The gully protected the town of Ortona. German tanks and infantry ran along its length, emerging to fire at any spot. Well, the Germans were on one side of it, and we were on the other side of it, and there was practically no cover. On December 11th, the West Novas advanced towards the German lines. They were stopped by a wall of machine gun fire before they got within 100 yards of the enemy position. The West Novas dug in and were shelled continuously. And the, the rain of fire they, they brought down on us with mortars and machine guns and artillery. It was unbelievable. Colonel Bogert was badly wounded. There was a stalemate until Lieutenant Harvey Jones found a way through the German defenses and destroyed the German headquarters. On December 16th, the West Novas made their final assault on the gully. 
we were terribly under strength. There was about two men where there should have been seven or eight. 160 men climbed out of their waterlogged slit trenches and advanced. Our last attack lasted about seven minutes, and then the half of them was gone. We went in on that attack, and that's when I got shot in the head, and that ended the war for me. Even though casualties were heavy, we are beginning to get used to this. Not easy to get used to, but we were getting used to it. The fighting was hard on the Italian people. Well, anywhere you go attack a town, you blow up buildings. There's civilians in it, there it is, that's it. I come across this little boy, he was about eight years old. He was dying. I knew he was dying because he had the back of his head blown up. There was nobody there with him. And I don't know, I didn't know then, I still don't know why he was there among the dead and dying soldiers. And I know I'm much afraid that he must have been. The stuff you hate most about the war is getting seeing civilians getting killed. Girls and young fellas and young people and old people that had nothing to do with starting the war and no way to stop it. We were in the outskirts the day before the, the city fell, and uh, the commanding officer said, everybody in your trenches, there's going to be a, a artillery barrage of 800 guns. And the next day, the city of Ortona was a heap of rubble. One lad, a friend of mine by the name of Took, he said, I'm not getting in any trenches, I'm going to get in the shell hole because the shell no, never falls twice in the same place. But he was mistaken. On New Year's Eve, Lieutenant Reg Bullock was hit by an artillery shell. Reggie Bullock, Colonel Bullock's son. Of course, we'd gone to school together. His father was working just a few miles away. The 60-year-old man was given the heartbreaking task of graves registration. Captain Bullock rushed to his son's side. A wonderful old man, and of course his son Reg was my closest friend at that time, and I said, how is Reg, sir? He said, he's dead, which was very sad, very hard on the old man, of course, because Reg was his only son. With the wounding of Colonel Bogart, Major Ronnie Waterman took command of the regiment. And the first thing he said to me was, I'm going to have to get you blooded. An officer's no good to me unless he's been blooded. Ronnie was the most hated officer in the Canadian Army, but the most respected. I didn't hate him. I, 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 I had total confidence in him. He was a drunk. He was, uh, uh, you know, he, he seemed to know what to do drunk or sober. Well, I'm not sure I ever saw him sober. He'd sent you out on these horrendous tasks. You had the feeling that he knew what he was doing and uh, that uh, he wouldn't have asked you to do it unless it was necessary to do. I always said he was prisoner happy because every day he, uh, a word would come up to me, get prisoners. We want prisoners. We need information as to what the Germans have planned. The best time to take prisoners was uh, just dawn, just breaking dawn, that's when a man's resistant is at his lowest ebb. When they're looking at the business end of your rifle, they don't put up much resistance. <laughs> the Ariely Front, which was uh, the winter line uh, north of, uh, of Ortona, which, uh, which we held for pretty well for four months. We were uh, basically living in slit trenches and the weather was uh, ghastly. It rained most of the time, and if it wasn't raining, it was snowing. Millions of body lice. Just millions. I'm not exaggerating that. The Germans all had lice. And, and following them up in some of the dugouts they had in old buildings and, and trenches, that's, that's, how, that's where they come from. Fighting patrols, it was usually one officer and 10 men. 
They were known as one and tens. Night patrols is, a, is not an easy thing. It's, a, it's black as pitch, you know, and you're, you're always afraid of running into a German patrol. Usually what would happen when a patrol went out would be dead silence for about 20 minutes or half an hour, and then all hell would break loose. Uh, machine guns would start firing and mortars and all sorts of things. And when things had quietened down, the patrol would creep back uh, with or without casualties. I was given instructions to set up an ambush. We got ten men trailing along. You know, there's, somebody's going to kick a can or kick a piece of wire or something. They, they know that you're out there. So they start their mortars and the machine gun and everything else. And as we got out there, I got my guys in position. I said to myself, what am I doing here? Some soldiers embraced raiding. A newfie by the name of Charlie Fleet. He was just like a bandito. He had a six gun in his belt, a nasty looking knife. And if, if, if he could get a hold of a, a German machine gun, he would carry one of them. He always asked me to go with him. Well, I said to Charlie, ask somebody else. I was out with you last night. Oh, I want you. He would, um, he would get as close to the German trenches as he, as he could, and he, he kind of chuckled to himself. He said, uh, I guess we'll stir him up a little. And he would throw a grenade. And of course, that did stir them up. But we got away with it many times. The Hitler line was one of the great battles in which the West Novas were involved. The Hitler line was very, very heavily fortified, concrete pillboxes and uh, tank turrets dug in. We were scheduled to uh, uh, attack quite, quite early on the morning of the 23rd. But unfortunately, the squadron of, of supporting tanks was knocked out, every tank knocked out. There were tanks all around us on fire. It was a horrible sight, and the you know, tank would get hit, and it would burst into flames, and you know, the crew would be pouring out of it on fire. I never like to see a tank hit, because nine times out of ten, the crew never gets out. We actually did the Hitler line without tank support, but we did have this massive barrage. It was the, the biggest a barrage in the history of warfare up to that time. That as soon as the barrage started, the Germans put their own barrage up behind it. So we got caught in combination of our own barrage and their barrage. My company, which was A Company, uh, actually started that, uh, that attack. We were down to about half strength before we even started. The Germans were pretty well demoralized and uh, uh, they, we took hundreds of prisoners, hundreds and hundreds of prisoners. The West Novas were the first Canadian regiment through the Hitler line, and uh, they did a wonderful job there. In that Hitler line, uh, we had a lot of casualties. We didn't have no cover up there at all, at all, at all. I don't think we had many left. I mean, we maybe had 12 total. My company runner got hit in the gut. He was standing right beside me. There was nothing you could do for him, nothing. One of my buddies was wounded, so I crawled over to him, and that's the time that I got this bullet in my foot. You don't know when you're going to get it. The West Novas made the Melfa crossing on May 25th. They advanced through a storm of fire, but miraculously suffered only one casualty. The next German defensive position was the Gothic Line. The West Novas were to secure a bridgehead across the Foglia River. And the CO was on the field telephone to brigade headquarters. And as the company commanders walked in, we heard him saying, but sir, my battalion will be massacred. All the trees we noticed had been cut down and all the buildings blown down, so it gave the enemy a marvelous field of fire. There were minefields the other side of the river. Mines started going off. Men started shouting in agony, and the Germans who had laid this minefield as a killing ground, as the two Ford companies got into it, they opened up with machine guns, mortars, and artillery, and everything else. And it was a dreadful time. 
Well, I, I was walk, walking over there, my orderly was shot standing right beside me. Padre Wilmot, he went forward with the stretcher bearers who'd volunteered to do this, pleaded with them to go forward and help get the people out. And they spent the whole morning carrying the casualties back when those two companies went forward into the minefield. They knew it was there. The company commanders knew it was there. They'd received their orders to do it, and they did it. But they each got their legs blown off and lost a tremendous number of their people. I think that was as brave an action as I've ever seen. We lost every single platoon commander on, on the Gothic line, every single one. It has never been dwelt upon, never been explained, and uh, it's been more or less forgotten. San Lorenzo, which was another rough one. We had quite a job getting them out of there. They had some tanks with them. We knocked out one of their tanks. And there was a bridge across the river. The bridge was mined to blow up. Lieutenant GM Hebb rushed across the bridge to disable the explosives before they could be set off. A huge shell landed just in front of the building, blew me back into the building. I wasn't touched, but my two commanders were both badly wounded. They were the last two officers I had. I had a corporal commanding one platoon and a sergeant the other. And suddenly we spotted a Tiger tank ahead of us. We had nothing to stop a Tiger tank, really. They were so well armed. Monstrous thing. And it must have seen us at the same time. Because we saw its gun start to swing around. <laughs> it started to swing around. Next thing we knew, it was pumping a solid shot at us, an 88 millimeter solid shot at us. I've never been so terrified in my life. This was the third time the West Novas had tried to take San Lorenzo. Each building had to be cleared of Germans. The West Novas took the town after 40 hours of continuous fighting. The next ridge was also defended by the Germans. San Fortunato Ridge. C and D companies had so few men left that they turned them into one company. That's a real mess. And we got halfway up the hill, and we couldn't get any further. We were being shelled and machine gunned. Each time a man moved a finger, he'd be fired at, you know. There were Tiger tanks up on the hill, and uh, they were coming forward, knocking out any armor they saw down below, and then pulling back over the bridge. And they were firing solid shot at any buildings that we captured. So you get into a building, <laughs> The, the wall would suddenly collapse in front of you and behind you as one of these solid shot went through. And this time the attack was successful and we captured San Fortunato Ridge. Harvey Jones and I were the only two rifle company officers to survive. Yeah. And he was, he was killed a few weeks later. His company was in action attacking one of the, across one of the rivers in the Po Valley and uh, a shell landed quite a distance away and a piece that went through his heart. It was not a, a very wide river, but it was quite deep and it was quite uh, a fast flowing river. There were three companies that were going to cross it at different places. We came under heavy artillery fire because they knew we were coming across the river. And they clobbered us. Uh, uh, it, uh, C Company took an awful beating and we took a lot of beating, enormous number of wounded guys. The company was nearly wiped out. It was a matter of, of getting them out of there. And that was just before uh, Christmas of uh, uh, 44. On December 24th, Major Hiltz was made Lieutenant Colonel of the regiment. We were going to the Western Front and join up with the rest of the Canadian Army. February 9, 1945, the regiment moved to Marseille, France. By sea. They were moved by train to Holland, where they joined the 1st Canadian Army. We were co close enough to hear the guns on the Western Front. I felt so sorry for the Dutch people. Many of them were at the point of starvation. The Germans took everything 
they could get their hands on from the farmers. And uh, the, the Dutch people were eating uh, tulips, which kept them from starving to death. We spread out in line and we walked up to Appledore that took many prisoners because the war was getting pretty well over. There was tanks and vehicles and motorcycles and there's truckloads of machine guns. Uh, they never had no ammunition, no fuel to move the vehicles. That's how bad it had got for them. There wasn't a lot of resistance, although there was some resistance, some fanatics and so on. And we met up with lots of these young, uh, I guess they were Hitler youth. They were young kids and they were, they, they were tough to deal with. Well, they wouldn't surrender. The Hitler youth, they were born to be bad. They were bad kids, they were kids, 14, 15 years old. They load us on tanks and we headed off through the woods toward this little town called Putten. It's a beautiful little town with a beautiful a town square and it was absolutely covered with these dead Dutch, Dutch boys and, and men, all with their eyes open and lying dead there. The Dutch underground, you know, rose up and attacked the Germans and the Germans rounded them all up and they killed all the men and boys that they could get their hands on. We tuned into the BBC in London. All German forces in Europe have surrendered unconditionally to Field Marshal Montgomery. And we couldn't believe our ears. Everybody looked at each other just as much as to say, are we dreaming? Do we hear the truth? Can it possibly be over after five years? And we sat there for a while and there was no cheering or shouting or screaming or anything. There wasn't a hooray or there was nothing. There was just, it was over. On May 21st, 1945, the West Novas participate in a victory parade through The Hague. The residents were all in the streets waving flags and uh, Cheering us. Everyone was, thank you, thank you, and that's all you could hear from the time you started till you got the end of the parade. With the war in Europe over, the battalion was sent home through Nijmegen, Ostend, and Dover. In Southampton, they boarded the Ile de France, bound for Canada. On October 1st, 1945, the regiment landed in Halifax. They were greeted on the dock by their old commander, Lieutenant Colonel Bullock. They marched to Citadel Hill amongst cheering crowds, where they spontaneously dispersed. In the Second World War, thousands of men wore the badge of the West Nova Scotia Regiment. It's impossible to tell all of their stories. The boys and men of the West Nova Scotia Regiment fought and won 26 campaign and battle honors. This total is the second highest for the hard-fighting Canadian Army. The brave officers and men of the regiment won numerous awards and decorations. 352 West Novas paid the final sacrifice during the war. 1,084 were wounded or have no known grave. The survivors were changed forever. We had a lot of nice guys, you know, and a lot of them got killed, too. That was the best time of my life. It was a wonderful regiment. It was my privilege to serve with it. But I never had any brothers, but I, I had 850 of them in the regiment. Everybody else in the regiment would be your best friend because you depended on them all the time. It was diverse, in a way. But we were all in one. We were one. We were Canadians. Nova Scotia. I think they were all in the same category as being brave, brave people. You know, you're living with these guys and you're living in these horrible conditions with them. A feeling of uh, loyalty to them is very strong. And I guess that's what keep you, keeps you going. Yeah. The combat soldier, they'll never get over the war. 
I know I don't. I didn't. And they were one hell of a bunch of good men. And that they sure as hell were. <laughs>